What do you think about Blu-rays? I don't have a Blu-ray player, so they mean nothing to me. I have a Blu-ray player, but I really don't feel the urge to go out and rebuy all my DVDs on Blu-ray, because that would be crazy. You don't want to fill up landfills like that. Yeah. Blu-ray, come back to me in 15 years. I have a couple of Blu-rays right here. This I found at a thrift store for $4.50, still in the shrink wrap, Scarface. Now I can finally make you watch Scarface, just like Arctic Camo wanted me to. <laughs> Say hello to my little Blu-ray. Hello. This I just got. This is Long Day's Journey in Tonight, Sidney Lumet. This movie is nearly four hours long, but you wouldn't know it. Uh, it's so engaging. The dialogue is quite repetitive, but it's so well written. Eugene O'Neill is such a legendary writer that um, you don't really mind it. But if there's any movie that has needed its own drinking game, it's Long Day's Journey into Night. Every time James Tyrone tells someone they don't know the value of a dollar, <laughs> drink. Anytime someone lashes out at another character and then immediately apologizes, drink. Yeah, I... Anytime Catherine Hepburn touches her hair, you'll die if you play that drinking game. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Welcome back to The Basement, Craig. Oh, it was a pleasure, Matt. As I said last time, I would not be picking tonight's movie, and neither would you. I still have no idea what you mean by that. Well, it means that I've invited a third party to curate tonight's episode. He's a personal friend of both of us. He was at the season one rap party, and he is as much of a movie buff as either of us will ever be. He's Rob Matsushita. Hello, I'm Rob Matsushita. Rob plays the character of Lloyd in the web series Chad Vader. He is also a freelance filmmaker, playwright, and creator of the super violent web series Chapel. You can check him out on IverPictures.com. Now, Craig, you know me. You know how much of a control freak I can be. Yes. And that I couldn't let Rob just choose any movie. Mm hmm. I had to give him some parameters. As you may or may not know, I have a secret list of the movies that I'm considering for this show. A list of over 200 films. From this list, I've created a short list of 50 movies that cover a wide swath of cinematic eras and genres. That is the pool that Rob chose from. And as a reward for his service, he gets to pick any movie he wants that I haven't seen and add it to the list to replace the one that he took off. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. What movie did he pick, you must be wondering. Well, let's find out. Take it away, Rob. This is a very personal choice of mine. This is one of my favorite movies when I was a very uh, little kid, and it was also the first time when I gazed into the face of darkness and decided it was kind of cool. Uh, this movie contains what I feel is the probably de the definitive version of the character that we like to call the Morning Star, the Prince of Darkness, Satan himself. And that movie, of course, is Bedazzled. Oh, very nice. You've never seen this? No. I cannot believe you've never seen this. This is one of my favorite British comedies. It's the movie that got me into British comedy in the first place. Released in 1967 and directed by Stanley Donnan of Singing in the Rain fame, this movie features the comedy team of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Peter Cook for... Some of you who may not know, he's best known as saying the immortal lines, Mowage is what brings us together today. For your gift tonight, I thought I'd give you a little bit of the devil's music, but in a form that's sure not to lead you into temptation. Oh, it's a uh, black disc. It's the center of a record, it seems. Oh, it's a, it's a coaster. And it says... Fausto Papetti, Sex Alto. Fausto. Fausto. Yes. The guy who sold his soul to the devil -o. And he plays the saxophone, commonly known as the devil's instrument. <laughs> oh, it's, uh... <laughs> Come with us, won't you, to the old leather couch and be tempted by the satanic comedy of Bedazzled. Woo-ha, 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 woo-ha. Bejazzled. Stanley Moon, a short order cook, is in love with Margaret Spencer, a waitress who dresses like a flight attendant. But he's too meek to ask her out, and so he's depressed and decides to end it all. Good evening. I couldn't help noticing that you were making an unsuccessful suicide bid. I'm here to help you, Mr. Moon. I'm here to look like a band member from the Brian Jonestown <laughs> Massacre. He meets a man who claims to be Beelzebub, Mephistopheles, 
The Hornet one? As a demonstration of his superpowers, Satan gives Stanley a uh, popsicle as his first wish. You really must be the devil. Incarnate. How'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> He's going by George Spigot these days. George runs a fancy little nightclub down in the worst part of London called the Rendezvous Club. There he hangs out with the seven deadly sins. I'd like you to meet Anger. He works for me. Watch it, that's all. And he offers to buy Stanley's soul. The exclusive global and um, universal rights to it. And in exchange, give him what he desires most in the world, Margaret. Thoroughly convinced, Stanley signs away his soul for seven wishes. Stanley wishes he was more articulate. An intellectual who can get his ideas across to the one he loves. Yes, that's it. You know, like the talkie talks, the, who can get their points across so that they are allowed to touch the women. And so Satan says his magic words. Julie Andrews. He's granted his wish. Such fantastic delicacy, you see. But combined as well with this almost preternatural strength. Things are going pretty well. Of course. <laughs> but when Stanley tries to make a move, <laughs> he's accused of rape. The touching! <laughs> Bedazzled. You'll love the rape scene. <laughs> and Stanley's forced to go <laughs> to get out of the situation. <laughs> you go <laughs> and then you get go back to where you were before. Learning from his mistake, Stanley wishes to be already married to Margaret so he can skip the wooing. He also wishes to be powerful, because I'd like to give her lots of things. Yachts, servants, country estates, a phone in the lab. Yeah. And for Margaret to be more physical. Julie Andrews. <laughs> Afternoon, Sid. Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, I'm so hot and sticky and randy. We must have a dip. And she wants to get it on all the time but not with Stanley, and is physical with other people, including George Spigot in the bathtub. Oh, breasts. Oh, with the breasts in the mirror and the whoo boy buddy. But um, uh, about this uh, Venezuelan business. He gets out of that one and goes back to Satan. Look. <laughs> They asked for beads, and they got bees. Those nice, gentle flower people grooving along quietly, and you had to come and mess it up. The Prince of Darkness encourages Stanley to get a good night's sleep. He dresses him up in some cute little pajamas and... Oh, well, that's very handsome, I must say. He looks like Cindy Lou Who. Lets him sleep in his own bed. Morning, Mr. Moon. Stanley's woken up in the morning by breakfast, served by none other than Lust. Look out there. Don't we make a pretty pair? After this brief encounter with lust... Goodbye, Mr. Moon. Stanley wishes to be lusted after by Margaret. He figures that way he'll get the sex that he's been craving this whole time. Let me have it! Julie Andrews! Love me! So Stanley becomes a Cliff Richards-esque pop star. He's got women screaming all over him, including Margaret. A new singer comes out who looks remarkably like Satan, and he sings a song that's just the opposite. I don't want you. You fill me with inertia. So Margaret chooses Satan. And then he's got to go out of that one, too. She's with that powerfully built Inspector Clark. Satan informs him that Margaret is developing a creepy romance with the cop who's investigating Stanley's apparent suicide. And he makes a classic first-timer's error. Wish I was a fly on the wall. Julie Andrews! You run! <laughs> you tricked me again! That wasn't meant to be a wish! And the cop is kind of pushy and creepy. He talks about rape all the time. I've had three rapes on my hands this morning. Ah, uh, rape. I've always had mixed feelings about rape. I'm repulsive. He gets out of being a fly just in time before he nearly dies of fly-related injuries. Oh, that's quite unsavory. <laughs> Stanley's finally figured out how to do it. He wants Margaret to have domestic bliss. Julie! <laughs> <laughs> darling. Hello, darling. Except for the fact that Margaret's not married to Stanley, she's married to Stanley's best friend, who looks a lot like Satan. 
they're having an affair behind their husband's back. Because he wants to die at home. They both can't stop crying long enough to fornicate in a car. Oh no, another trick by the Lord of the Flies. George Spigot informs Stanley that he's actually had an ongoing contest with God. And the first one to reach 100 billion souls is the winner. I'll go back to heaven, sit on God's right hand, and be his favorite angel again. Do, 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 do. Finally, Stanley has had it. I think you've got me this time, Stanley. Now let me get it quite clear. He wishes for a nice, peaceful life. And no other men in her life. Julie Andrews. <laughs> and he ends up being turned into a nun, where he's forced to be silent to burn his possessions. He's a nun. They gotta burn the suitcase. That's what <laughs> nuns do. And to engage in weird trampoline rituals. It's that game they play in the prisoner. They bounce around in the trampolines and, and then they fall into the water. <laughs> During all this, when Stanley goes, nothing happens. So he finds his way back to the Devil's Nightclub and says, what's the deal? Stanley didn't know when to start counting his wishes. Because when he got the freezy pop at the beginning of the movie, that was a wish too. That didn't count. Of course it did. It was a wish, wasn't it? And now he's stuck as a nun. Stanley is very moody. Hey! Saxophone! That's right. And George Spigot prepares for his big meeting with God. I'd rather miss you. Look, I'll tell you what, Stanley. George decides to give Stanley back his soul because he really doesn't need it. It's a very magnanimous gesture. Now then, take this, burn it up, and when it's all gone, you'll be Stanley Moon again. Satan goes up to his meeting with God. I gave that little twit his soul back. Wasn't that generous? I'm afraid you failed the entrance examination. I can't have failed. He runs back down to Earth to try to get the soul back, but Stanley's already burned it, and so he's back where he started from. <laughs> there he is, cooking at the Wimpies. Can you believe it? Still in love with Margaret of the much eye shadow. I've got to do it. I, I know I can. I know I will. You look like a creepy clown. And he asks Margaret out on a date. <laughs> Satan says, I'm going to go back to being the bad guy and I'm going to show you someday. I'll cover the world in Tasty Freeze and Wimpy Burgers. Come on, Satan. I want a Tasty Freeze in my neighborhood. And although it's just one small step forward, Stanley has traveled a million miles away from the life that he woke up with that day. When Satan was threatening to cover the world in Tasty Freeze, as a little kid, I thought that that was the most wonderful thing that Satan could bring the world. <laughs> Satan's not evil. He's just thoroughly misunderstood. But that is what he claims in Bedazzled. Uh, is this an accurate portrayal of Satan? I've never met the guy myself. He's well, the cool bad guy in the story. So this is a comedy. The classic definition of comedy is that the main character has a tragic flaw that they then overcome. What do you think Stanley's tragic flaw was? He isn't much of a man. His meekness. He's meek. Of course, to overcome his meekness, all he needs to do is take one little step. Yes. So it's, it's actually quite inspirational for people like me, who are like Stanley, who have a difficult time getting a date. But, well, you don't need to get a date. You... That's right. <laughs> uh, sure don't. Bing! He, he's going to keep on being <laughs> meek, because it's been working great for him. Bedazzled! I'm glad I had that handy prop sitting here on my desk. <laughs> It's a very modern comedy. The meanness, without getting too mean, uh, is something that was very much different from the comedies that came before and very much informed the comedies that came after. It's also very sketchy. You know, like the, sketch comedy. Yeah, the, which seems to be something new for, for that time. 67, you didn't I, really see a lot of that. It feels so dense, and yet, when we were recounting it over on the couch, it's easier... To tell the story of this movie than it was to tell the story of Swing Time. Yeah. That's yeah. really, really weird. Because all of the little vignettes where Stanley makes his wish, Stanley's progressing as a character. He's mm -hmm. learning a little something about himself. And even Satan is learning a little something. Although, yes, Satan is kind of a jerk, he is also completely charming and, in a weird way, kind of lovable. And you believe the friendship between Dudley Moore's character and Satan. God's never taken any interest in me, as far as I can see. You actually kind of believe that they sort of could be friends. I want to protect you, Stanley. I like you. I'd hate to see you swatted. What did you think about their friendship? I... Did you think it was real, like Rob did? It it does feel pretty substantial. Stanley wasn't randomly chosen by Satan to be the one guy whose soul he gives back. It's 
really interesting because I think Stanley's meekness really allowed that friendship to flourish. If Stanley wasn't this very timid man, he'd be like, Oh, Satan, you did it to me again! Yeah. And, and he'd be pissed off. But he didn't, and so it, it allowed them to develop a relationship which facilitated Satan giving him his soul back and ultimately his salvation. His tragic flaw worked for him, and then he was able to shed the tragic flaw and move on to being a fully realized man. You know what makes Satan particularly real to me? I knew guys like Satan when I was young. And I think everyone knows someone like Satan. Totally unflappable. He always knows the right answer. He's a prankster, doesn't care about the rules. Sets your mind at ease and then sticks the knife in you. He's just misunderstood that he has a bad father who doesn't appreciate him and he's trying to get his attention. He's a guy... You know who we're talking about. Yeah. Gerald. He keeps getting in trouble and he keeps getting you in trouble. And, but if you want to hang out with them, you're going to be getting in trouble. Satan and God. Are they kind of the same in this movie? It sort of seems that way. How so? Because God seems like kind of a jerk, too. God has an evil laugh. (laughs) He gives Satan the runaround, just Mm -hmm. like Satan gave Stanley the runaround. Satan is God's Stanley. Yes, basically. 60s comedies, they like to joke about rape. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and every time I see that, I just I cringe so much. Because because back then, rape was like, oh, oh, rape. Oh. That's right. Well, I was happy we had a movie where we didn't have to talk about blackface or race relations. <laughs> but now we have to talk about rape. <laughs> that was bedazzled. We were bedazzled. And if you haven't been bedazzled, check it out. You'll have so much fun. And understand why your grandfather... Gets all excited when the words Raquel Welch come up. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Check out welcometothebasementshow.com. You can also make a donation to the show uh, using the PayPal button. Our recent donors are Bill, Richard, Susan, Brendan, Stephanie, Ryan, Robert, Isaac, John, Chloe, Sarah, Michael, and Samil. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to entertain you guys, and we're glad that you are enjoying it. Amanda Cook writes about Tough Guys Don't Dance, a movie that we watched recently on this show. This movie looks inscrutable and mortifying, like seeing the face of God. After the initial Putney Swope panic wore off, Matt seems to have reached enlightenment. Oh, God. Meanwhile, Craig just lost ten years of his life. Oh, Oh, man. man. (laughs) Very well put, Amanda. Uh, To find out what all that's about, check out the Tough Guys Don't Dance episode of this show. Garrett Joyce writes... All caps. I just discovered this show and now I can't stop. Damn it. I don't have time for this right now. Garrett, we're happy to overwhelm you. Here's another one of Craig's admirers. Mary Kate Olson. I hope it's the real one. Yes. Craig is my secret internet crush. I'd take him to see Lincoln on Lincoln's birthday. Lincoln is in quotes. That sounds really dirty for some reason. <laughs> I don't for know some reason, why. it's because she's got a crush on you. I know. Well, keep up the good work. <laughs> and now, <laughs> seen it, Julie Andrews. NDGV two. If you like Peter Dinklage, and who doesn't, you should watch The Station Agent. Pretty good movie. I think that's a very apt description of that movie. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's Dinklage obviously is is a genius. For God's sake, will someone please do Richard the Third with this guy? Get on it, Hollywood. Plus, they just found Richard the Third's body over in England. So timely. It's topical. Timely. Karen Hebert from Facebook. How about foreseeing it? Any of the Ghost Rider movies with Mister Wacky Nicholas Cage? There have been two of them. I've seen them both. The first more times than I'd care to admit to, because uh, we actually did a Rift Tracks for Ghost Rider, which you can find on RiftTracks.com. Matt and Aaron wrote it, and uh, me and Jason Stevens did a little bit of touch-up work on it. The first Ghost Rider is, wow, it's a bad movie. Ghost Rider Part 2, much better. Really? It is. That's good to know. Natural Worm. My favorite love story is As Good As It Gets. Everyone in it is so good, the premise is sound, and has some yoinkable lines for a date. Seen it. Not seen it. Have I seen any of these so far? Last episode, we talked about redeemable assholes. Uh, Groundhog Day being a prime example. I believe, as good as it gets, uh, I don't think Nicholson is a redeemable asshole. I mean, you kind of like him in the same way you kind of like Satan in this movie. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But the, the relationship between him and Helen Hunt does not make any sense. It doesn't work for me. I don't see the... The turn that's supposed to have happened, I I don't see it in there. Carla Renee 
Speaking of Biggie's son, Christopher Wallace Jr. was in a movie a couple years ago with Will Ferrell called Everything Must Go. Will does a great job in this dramatic role, and Christopher got rave reviews. Have you seen it? If not, you must. Uh, I have seen it. <clears throat> I did. I hated it. I really did. I have not seen the movie. I've seen one half of the suggestions. You've seen the next two. Okay. Good, you definitely good. seen the next two. The first thing I hated about it was they said it was based on a Raymond Carver story. It is not. It has absolutely nothing to do. I'm a huge Raymond Carver fan. I think he's one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and it's sort of a travesty to attach his name to this very formulaic drama. Christopher Wallace Jr. is, is shaping up to be quite a, a good actor, but I just I hated this movie. It was so formulaic. The story was so dull. You know exactly where it's going, and it goes to that exact spot, and... In the middle of it, I was just like, I didn't even see the point of watching this anymore. Yeah, it was just really didn't like it. Go on. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? No, you no. don't. It's moving on then. <laughs> Cat S. Easter-themed WTTB. Harvey, please. Seen it. Seen the play. You gotta be f***ing kidding me. seen Harvey. Harvey's a, a lot of fun. Harvey's a classic. I finally found the origin of Nobody Brings Anything Small into a Bar. I heard it uh, first in the Tom Waits song, Ninth and Hennepin, I believe it is. Ah, there's nothing wrong with her. $100 won't fix. Which I believe that is entirely is from the movie Harvey <laughs> with James Stewart. <laughs> oh, the, the donuts of names that sound like prostitutes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Harvey, go out and see it. Don't be like Craig. Marcus Sventkovsky. You guys should watch Team America World Police. Seen it. Started watching it. Turn it off. What? Was not amused. I was not amused either. No. I watched the whole thing. I thought parts of it were such a blatant rehash of the South Park movie that it was embarrassing. The plot was so similar to action movie plots that it was just an action movie. And that the dialogue wasn't all that good. Kim Jong-il singing a song called I'm Ronery. I mean... You can do better than that. One thing. South Park, guys. That's seen it, and that's our show. We'd like to thank you for stopping by and having a devilishly good time. (laughs) 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 With Bedazzled. Be sure to check out WelcomeToTheBasementShow.com and make a donation. Hey, Craig, I had such a good time with having someone else curate the show. I think I'm going to have somebody do it again for the next episode. You're so lazy. Who will it be? We'll find out next time. See you later. I find clothes so constricted We must allow our paws to breathe That's better Alright, pillow, pillow in place, here we go (laughs) Julia!